Hello everyone, my name is Giovanni Estrada and I'm with the International We Love You Foundation. We hope you all are excited for this week because this week is Earth Week. This Friday is Earth Day. This month is Earth Month. And the theme for our webinar series is Invest in Our Planet. So why should we invest in our planet? It's because this is your planet. You all are the future. Therefore, we have the responsibility to make an impact and take care of this world. So how can we do this? We can do this by awareness, by understanding different programs and different initiatives you all can participate in. This week, we have different professionals from those who work in local government offices to even professors who dedicate their life to making an impact here in this world. So we hope that we can inspire you to also do the same. We cannot have done this without our partners. So huge shout out to our partner, Junior Achievement, and to our sponsors, Hayward and Waste Management. So before we get into our first session, we want to make introductions. So first, who is the International We Love You Foundation? The International We Love You Foundation is an NGO, or you can say a, a nonprofit, which stands for Non-Governmental Organization. And we are associated with the United Nations Department of Global Communications. We believe that we are all in this together. We live in this world, and we feel like we're a global family. But the way to really make an impact and a change in this world is through a mother's love. I want you to think about your mother. Your mother woke up this morning, cooked you some food, right? Maybe take you to school as well. But a mother plays an important role in a household. That's why we believe with that same mindset and with that same heart, we can also make an impact here in this world. My biggest role model is the chairwoman of the International We Love You Foundation, Zhang Gyoja. She says, love is needed now more than ever in our society. There's so many things going on here in this world. There's a need for education. There's a need when it comes to food. There's a need when it comes to blood shortage. So with that mindset of a, of a mother, with a mother's heart, we believe that we can really make an impact in many different initiatives. In what way? So we, again, are associated with the United Nations, and we carry out many initiatives that align with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Basically, what they are is 17 goals that the United Nations established, and they believe, and we believe, that we can really make an impact and make a change by tackling issues when it comes to education, when it comes to clean water, when it comes to pretty much anything. But again, through a mother's love, we believe that we can do this. Here are some initiatives that we carry out. We have the Clean World Movement. So we do cleanups all around the world. We do campaigns in education, even emergency relief and international aid. And here are some examples of different events that we have done. Actually, all over the U.S. and even in 2020, we were able to donate 400 devices that were actually the Chromebooks for a school. We were also able to donate 2,000 backpacks uh, for an elementary school. So depending on the need of the community, we're more than happy to carry out different events. Also, one of the biggest events that we carry out every year are blood drives. So since January 1st, 2021, we were able to collect 2,585 pints of blood, which equals to 7,755 lives saved. And we hope you all can join us as well. This was our latest blood drive, which happened at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Even celebrities joined. Even the football players joined. But the ones who's missing is you all. So next time, we'll let you know. And also, we also do a lot of emergency relief. Hurricane Ida hit in September 2021 in New Jersey, and our volunteers immediately went out to a community and helped out. Also, there was another emergency relief that took place in Texas. There was a shortage of water, and our, and our volunteers went out and also did this water donation event. And also environmental initiatives. And this is what we're excited about. We do, again, 
environmental initiatives, cleanups at parks, beaches, everywhere. And we hope you can join us in ours this weekend. So in 2017, we were able to collect 20,000 tons of pound. Think about it like this. One elephant is around two tons. So this is 20 tons of trash. But 2021, we were able to collect 73,000 tons of trash. So really, it's an amazing impact that we all are making. But the reason that we are here today is because we want you all to be involved in future events that we'll be carrying out. So we want to thank you all so much because truly, without you all joining, we couldn't have done this event. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you all our partner. So our partner is Junior Achievement. So actually, let's give one big round of applause for Junior Achievement, just because they're so amazing. Awesome. So Junior Achievement, oh, this is actually Emma here. Emma works with Junior Achievement, and they were just nominated for the Nobel, Pe Nobel Peace Prize. So before we start, I just want to say, hello, Emma. How's your day going today? It's, it's going, going great. great. Happy, Happy Monday. Monday. Happy Monday. So how do you feel about this week, Emma? Oh, oh I am so, so excited. excited. My, My last name is Green, so I'm always for the environment, environment but this is an <laughs> extra special <laughs> week, and, and we're so excited to be sharing it with the students across Palm Beach, Beach County and the Treasure Coast. Coast. So I'm, I'm pumped. pumped. Awesome. I'm pumped, too. So without further ado, I'm sure the students would love to know how they can be involved in future events that you guys all host. So please, uh, Emma, please take it away. All, All right. right. Well, well, good morning, morning to everyone joining us. I know we have schools from across the area, but a real quick special shout out to Crystal Lakes Elementary. Elementary. Um, if my last name seems familiar, it's because it is. My mom is Miss Green, your principal. So we are so excited to have you as well as all of the other wonderful students from across the area. Um, so I'm a program manager with Junior Achievement. I work primarily with our middle and high schools to help teach kids just like you about three main things. We teach you some about entrepreneurship, Work, work readiness and financial, financial literacy. literacy. And, and so, so one of the big things, things that you're gonna learn today are about future careers that you can do one day. day. So, so if you love the environment or you're, you're passionate, passionate about helping others, others there might be a job you learn about this week that could be your future. And, and so we are so excited and we hope that you're able to learn about different careers in the environmental field and how you can take small steps every day to invest in our planet. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, Emma, that was amazing. If you all want to learn more on how you can be involved in future events that Junior Achievement does, please vi visit this website at www.palmbeachtreasurecoast.ga.org. And we'll be sending up the links as a follow-up as well. So now for the main event, our first speaker. But actually, before we even get there, I want to share with you all this nice template. So Junior Achievement did an amazing job in putting this template together, which has a bio of our speaker. And there's some boxes where you can go ahead and take notes and even input some questions. But why do you want to take notes? Why would you want to write down some questions? It's because at the end of the presentation, we're going to have a Q&A session, which is going to be an awesome time. So throughout the event, uh, throughout this session, please feel free to input the questions in the chat box. So for our first speaker. So our first speaker, her name is Emily Surma, and she works with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So one round of applause for Emily. Hello, Emily. How's your day going today? Good. Good. Happy, Happy Monday. Monday. Happy Monday. So I have to ask you the same question. How do you feel about this week? I am super ecstatic for Earth Week. This, this is like my biggest, biggest holiday because I am so lucky that I get to do this environmental, environmental work all year round. But, but this is finally the week where everybody else is super excited about this environmental work as well. And everyone is really thinking about their impact and how to get involved. So that makes me really happy. And I'm really excited to have the whole global community involved in, in what, what my favorite, favorite topic is, my favorite thing to do. So, so I'm really excited. excited. Again, we're so honored you were able to join us. So the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is a local government office 
that works on restoring the ecosystem. But without further ado, we have Emily here. So we'll love to hear more about your journey. So please take it away. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited, excited to share. share. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. So I'll, I'll go ahead and hop in. in. Um, like, like we said, we're going to be taking questions at the end, and, and I will make sure to save time, time for your questions because I'm so, so excited to answer them. them. I'm, I'm kind of going to go through some of our projects pretty quickly just, just to give you guys an overall idea of what we do. So that way, if you have any questions about the specific projects, you can go ahead and throw them in and give them to us so I can answer them. So like I said, it'll be kind of an overview. So that's why I'm so excited to hear your questions. So please, please submit some great questions for me. Um, like Gio said, my name is Emily Sermont, and I work for the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Preserves. So, so today, today we'll sort of talk about the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Reserves. Reserves. We'll, we'll talk, talk about my team and who I work with, and my story, and a little bit of their stories as well. And then, and then we'll jump into the programs that we have at our Aquatic Reserve office, office and the things that we do to help our environment year-round. So I work, I work for, for the Florida Department, Department of Environmental Protection. Protection. There's, There's a couple of layers to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection because it's a really, really big agency. So, so the Florida Department, Department of Environmental Protection, Protection is our state agency in Florida that, that deals with yes, yes, environmental, environmental protection. protection. So, so that, that includes, includes all of our state parks. parks. They're, They're part of the Florida Department, Department of Environmental Protection, which we like, we like to use acronyms. So FDEP is what, what we call ourselves. ourselves. So, so the state, state parks are part of DEP. Um, environmental permitting. So, so if people are going to be building, building new developments, they, they have to get the OK from the FDEP. Um, all, all of our beach and waterway management, the FDEP is involved. So we're, we're all over the state, state from the Panhandle all, all the way to the Keys. And within FDEP, I work for the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. So our goal at the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection is we really focus on our coastal and aquatic resources. So we are all about water. And we're about protecting this water for the benefit of citizens like you all, and also to keep the environment healthy and for the benefit of all the different organisms that live in our waters in Florida. So at the bottom of the screen, these are all of the different programs and projects that are within the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. So we have a lot going on to protect Florida's waterways. And, and I work in that first program that's listed, the Aquatic Preserve Program. And, and within that Aquatic Preserve Program, this is our last layer, I work for the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Preserves. So our Aquatic Preserves, as in the Indian River Lagoon, stretch um, over 156 miles from the Mosquito Lagoon, which is up in Volusia County, so that's that sort of near New Smyrna. Um, it's near the beach, uh, across from Orlando, so that's pretty high up, all the way down to the Jupiter Inlet. We have an aquatic preserve there as well. And if you look at the map on the right side of the slide, all of those yellow highlighted areas are all of our different aquatic preserves. So we'll talk about the Indian River Lagoon some more in a minute. But, but it's, it's a really, really, really long estuary. estuary. And, and then we make sure that we, of course, protect, protect the whole Indian River Lagoon, but, but those highlighted pieces are our preserves. And that's really where we focus our work in those, those specific areas of the lagoon. So we have seven preserves across the lagoon. And like we said, that spreads a really long distance. It covers six counties. So, so and these are a lot of the counties that you guys live in. So Palm Beach County, Martin County, Indian River County, and then, and then we, we also include Brevard and Volusia County. We manage over 97,106 acres, and most of it is water. We manage over 150 spoil islands, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We do lots of research. We do some restoration projects. That means bringing back healthy habitats that have been lost. And we also do outreach, like today, me talking to you all. We monitor, we monitor different plants and animals. We'll, we'll get, get into, into this more in a minute because there are lots of programs that we run. But that's, that's sort of the gist of what the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Preserve is. So, so the Indian River Lagoon Aquatic Preserve was established to protect our Indian River Lagoon. And, and the, the Indian River Lagoon is an extremely biodiverse habitat. habitat. So, so what does biodiverse mean? Biodiversity means there's a huge variety of life. We have over 4,000 different species of plants and animals. So that's not just 4,000 animals. That's 4,000 different species. We have everything from sharks to turtles to small fish, crabs, barnacles, birds, a whole, whole big variety of life. From teeny tiny little organisms to 
dolphins, dolphins and manatees, manatees and big, big sharks, sharks, a whole variety of animals. The, the Indian River Lagoon is a brackish water estuary. So brackish water means it's a mix of fresh and salt water. So we get fresh water from our rivers and our runoff from the land. And then we also have inlets throughout the lagoon that bring in salt water. So with this mix of ocean and fresh water, that's why we have so much life in the Indian River Lagoon. We have animals that swim in from the ocean, we have animals that come in from the rivers, and they all mix together and it provides a big habitat for this whole variety of animals. Like, like we, we said before, the lagoon is really long. long. It's 156, 156 miles long, but it's, but it's relatively, relatively shallow. It's really only three, three to four feet, feet for the most part. And it has three major basins. So if you look at the map on the right, let's see if I can blow up my little laser pointer. Um, we have the Mosquito Lagoon. That's the farthest north. And the Mosquito Lagoon water can get quite cold. Um, then, then we have the Banana, Banana River, River, which is the second basin below it, near Cape Canaveral, where that part of the state sticks out a little bit. And then, and then we, we have, have the Indian River Lagoon proper, which, which stretches all the way from sort of that tip of Volusia County, which again is pretty far north, that's up by Lake Orlando, and goes, goes all the way down to Jupiter Inlet, where our water is pretty warm year-round, and it's a pretty different, different habitat than our habitats in the northern part of the region. Now that's another reason why we have so much life in the Indian River Lagoon, is because we sort of straddle two different climate zones. So we have quite cold, cold water in the northern, northern parts, parts of the lagoon and quite warm, warm water from the Gulf Stream in the southern parts of the lagoon. So not only do we have fresh water and salt water mixing, but we also have a temperate habitat, so a little bit colder up in the northern areas, and a tropical habitat, which is quite warm with clear blue water in the southern parts. So that's why it hosts such a wide variety of life. And the Indian River Lagoon is our estuary here on the eastern coast of Florida, but there are estuaries all over the world. Estuaries, estuaries are essentially just a place where the land meets the sea. It's, it's usually where a river system meets an ocean system. And, and like we said, we get tons of life. So here are some pictures of some of the animals that we see in the Indian River Lagoon. And like, like estuaries, estuaries all over the world, the Indian River Lagoon provides a lot of different ecosystem services, which serve us as humans. And it also provides habitat and a place, place to live for many, many different, different organisms. organisms. So, so estuaries all over the world provide nursery habitat. Most, most of the fish, most, most of the commercial fish that humans around the world consume come from estuaries. So, so lots of baby fish, fish and, and birds and turtles. Estuaries, estuaries are a great place for them all to grow up because it's a protected area. It's not out in the open ocean. ocean. It's, it's a little bit more protected from wind and storms and predators since it's, it's you know, a bit shallower. So, so estuaries, estuaries serve as nursery habitat all over the world. Estuaries, estuaries also provide a source of food. So if there's lots of little fish, that's going to bring lots of big fish. So we have a really... Um, Intense, intense food, food chain in the Indian River Lagoon where we have lots, lots of animals, animals being born and, and lots of food, food sources. So, like, like I said, little, little fish bring big, big fish. So we have a whole giant food web in our estuaries, estuaries all over the world. Estuaries, estuaries also provide a breeding site for many animals. Horseshoe, horseshoe crabs breed in the Indian River Lagoon. Lots, lots of bird species, like, like we said. Um, we're we're going to talk about this little turtle later. That's a diamondback terrapin. They're also born in estuaries. Um, um, estuaries, estuaries also provide a migration stopover. So, so here, here in Florida, Florida, we get a lot of migrating birds. birds. And, and a lot of these birds are migrating from all the way up. We're talking, you know, near, near the North, North Pole. Pole. And then flying, flying all the way down, down to South, South America. America. So, so these, these birds rely on the Indian River Lagoon, Lagoon, especially the islands, to be able to stop and take a break and get, get some food before they continue flying thousands of more miles down to South America. So... Our estuary, the Indian River Lagoon, and estuaries all over the world help provide places for these animals to stop and rest while they are doing flights that are thousands of miles. Estuaries also act as a filter and help filter some of our water before it gets to the ocean. Now, you need a really healthy estuary to act as a filter with lots of different plants and organisms. So what the estuary does is when it's nice and healthy and that fresh water runs into the estuary, our plants and animals help to suck up some of the pollutants that could be in that water before it gets to the ocean and keep our ocean nice and blue and beautiful. Estuaries also provide a buffer in the other direction. So if we have hurricanes and big storms offshore, our estuaries help protect our homes and where we live on the mainland. So if we have big, healthy plants and organisms in the lagoon, 
that, that wind, wind wave energy, energy can be blocked by, by our big trees and estuary and some of our plants. plants. And like, like we sort of touched on with the nursery habitat, estuaries are really important for economies all over the world. Most of the fish that we eat are born, born in the estuary or at least spend a part of their life in the estuary. Also in Florida, we rely on tourism. So lots of tourists want to come see the Indian River Lagoon. They want to rent boats. They have to buy gas and snacks for the day. They want to go relax on islands. They want to see lots of wildlife. So it's really a big economic driver for us who live in Palm Beach, in Martin, in Indian River County, those Treasure Coast counties. The Indian River Lagoon is really important for our economy. So our team, our goal is to help protect this Indian River Lagoon and keep it a special place for you all to enjoy. So this is our team, besides myself, I have a picture of myself on the next slide, but this is the rest of my team. And I have a little bit of a bio for each one of them. So our aquatic preserve manager, her name is Irene Arpajogla. She has her Master's of Science from Nova Southeastern University. So that's a Florida college that's down in Broward. County, and she, and she did, did her thesis, thesis work or her master's school work on seagrass, seagrass restoration. So, so Irene, Irene is actually originally from Uruguay, and, and so she's fully bilingual, bilingual which I think is amazing. She, she grew, grew up between Uruguay, New Jersey, and Florida, because both of her parents left Uruguay for several years during the Uruguayan dictatorship. So, so she actually immigrated to the United States when she was young. And, and both, both of her parents, parents are doctors, doctors so, so they were thankful that they were able, able to leave the country during that dictatorship. And she, she was, was able to come to the United States and start, start her life here. So, so she's lived in Florida for 24 years before she became our manager at our office. And, and she's worked for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection for seven, seven years before that in environmental, that in environmental permitting. So she, so she was one of those people that was helping to protect our natural resources and make sure that the developments were keeping our animals safe. She has years of experience working on the beach. She does turtle work, so turtle nesting work. When If you've been to the beach and see those people on those four-wheelers, that's what Irene did for a long time. And she also spent time working in aquaculture. And when she's not running our office, she's usually running ultra-marathons on the weekends. So this weekend, I think she's running a 50-miler. So when she's not running our office, she's actually running outside through the woods on the hottest days of the year. Next up is our... Avian, avian and, and bivalve specialist, so, so that, that means he works with birds and, and oysters for the most part. And his, his name is Matthew Anderson. He has his Bachelor's of Science in Wildlife Ecology from Humboldt University, and that's out in California. So Matthew loves to travel. He grew up in Florida, and he jumped at the opportunity to study wildlife biology and chase waves at Humboldt University in Northern California. He's, he's followed, followed his love for birds, birds all over the world, so he's worked in the field as a bird biologist in Puerto Rico, Venezuela, yes, yes Matthew, Matthew speaks Spanish, Spanish as well, uh, California, California and Florida. He has worked, worked for FDEP for 13 years, and he is our expert for all things oyster reef and bird at the office, and he's an expert for all things surfing and skating during his time off. Next, Next up is Kirk Fusco. Fusco. He, he is our horseshoe crab, crab expert, and he, and he has, has his Bachelor's of Science in Marine Biology from Florida Institute of Technology. So that school is in Florida, and, and it's up in Melbourne. Melbourne. And, and he grew up in Florida as well. He received his Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology from the Florida Institute of Technology. And, and before he came to our office, he worked at a zoo doing animal husbandry and, and conservation. conservation. So, so he, he took care of lots of different animals at the Brevard Zoo. He has also spent over 150 days at sea, so he used to work on vessels that would go out in the Gulf of Mexico, and he was the lead biologist on these seismic acquisition vessels. So truthfully, I don't know too much about that, so if you shoot me email, if you're interested in that career, I can send you to Kirk. And at our office, he's currently heading a brand new study that has never been done in the state of Florida that aims to better understand the movement of horseshoe crabs. So we'll get into that a little bit later. And, and when, when he's, he's not piloting these really cool research studies, studies he's usually scuba diving and getting incredible pictures and videos of Florida's reef inhabitants offshore. So he loves to go offshore diving and see the sharks and the turtles and all those cool big creatures. And then, and then Caitlin Britton, she's the newest member of our team, she is currently working on getting her Bachelor of Science in Biology from Indian River State College. So Caitlin is still in school. Um, she's, she's the newest member of our crew. She started, she started as our summer intern, helping Matthew with bird surveys and habitat enhancement. 
And with, and with her new position in our office, she oversees our Leave No Trace and Bark Ranger, Ranger programs, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And since she's still, still in school, we can only steal her part-time, which is a bummer, because we're really happy to have her. She has a fresh skill set that some, some of us other field biologists aren't so good at, like perfect handwriting, and she's, she's really good in the lab, whereas my handwriting is not so perfect, and I'm not so good in the lab, so we're really excited to have Kaylin to add those extra strengths to our team. And then over to me, you all know my name is Emily, and I don't. <laughs> you know, you we know, have so many experts, experts in our office, and I end up doing a lot of the plant projects. So I'm hesitant to call myself a plant expert, but I guess that's what I typically work on. You'll hear about some of my projects when we start to go through the PowerPoint. But, but I was actually born in Palm Beach County. County. So, so Palm Beach County schools, that's, that's where I grew up. I went to Dwyer High School. So Dwyer High School is it all tuned in. That's where I went to school in northern Palm Beach County. My, my mother has her bachelor's, bachelor's degree. degree. She's, She's a nurse. nurse. Um, and, and my father was a mechanic. So I have, I have one uh, parent, parent who has a bachelor's degree and a college degree, degree and one parent who doesn't. doesn't. And, and actually, my, my father passed, passed away when I was young. young. But, but I, I remember him vividly telling me that I needed to go to college because he didn't go to college. And I guess he sort of regretted that. So he was really adamant that I go to school. So... Um, I, I didn't, didn't really know what, what I wanted to do when I grew up. up. I, feel I feel like that's, that's a really hard question for a lot of people, and I really didn't know. When I was a kid, I loved the ocean. I still love the ocean. I don't know why I said when I was a kid. But, but um, and my, I really appreciate and really thankful to my mother for fostering in us a love for the outdoors. She, she took us kayaking to the beach all the time. I think she just wanted to run us out of all of our energy. But I really appreciate it because it really fostered a love for the outdoors. When I was a kid, I was, I was always running, running around with a disposable camera, camera which, which I don't even know if they make those anymore, to try to, try to snap pictures of different animals in my neighborhood. I used, I used to lay outside and watch the clouds and weather. I loved all the um, animal-themed cartoons and, and educational shows when I was a kid. And there, there were a couple times, you know, you know growing up in Florida, Florida, there was a lot of development going on. So as a kid, there were a couple times where I made websites and petitions to try to stop some of the development going on in my neighborhood. Um, but, but even though, though I was really involved and really loved all of those things, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I got older. I didn't, I didn't know anyone who worked in environmental science or biology. Like, like I said, my mom was a nurse, my dad, my dad was a mechanic, I, I knew people who were carpenters and who did administration and business, things like that. But I didn't know anyone who worked in biology or as a field biologist like what I do now working outside. So I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. In, in high school, school I tried, you know, know different, different career classes. classes, I tried early childhood education, I really liked journalism for a while, just, just trying, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And, and at that point, since I didn't, didn't know what I wanted to do, you know, I almost didn't want to go to college. But, but you, you know, my dad's, dad's voice in the back of my head, head as well as I am, you know, sometimes, sometimes school is hard, but I was a good student when I was in school, so I knew that college was probably a good choice for me because I liked going to school and I liked learning, and I was a pretty good student. So, so I decided that I should go to college, even though I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, and, you know, college is expensive, and it can be hard. So I ended up receiving a Bright Future Scholarship. So that scholarship is through the state of Florida, and that was really helpful for me to be able to afford to go to college, because without that Bright Future Scholarship, I wasn't going to be able to. So I started at my local community college, which is really helpful, and I actually finished my entire degree at community colleges. So, so first I went to Palm Beach State, State College, which is the local community college in Palm Beach County. County. And, and at Palm Beach State, State, I was actually, I was actually able to go to Costa Rica for a tropical, tropical ecology class. And um, I, I learned, learned a lot of different things at Palm Beach State and started taking classes to gear me more towards environmental science. science. I really decided for sure that, that I was going to do environmental science, science and, that and that was what I had decided after I spent some time out in Hawaii, actually. Because I noticed this was my first time really that far away from home. And, and I, I love the ocean so much, and I realized their, their oceans and their environments are hurting just like ours are in Florida. And that's, and that's the place that I love the most. most. That's where, where I like to be. So, so I wanted to make my life about protecting those environments. environments. And, that and that was when I really decided that that was what I was going to do, even though, though I didn't know anybody who did it, but I was just going to go for it. So I decided to go for it, and like I said, I took that tropical ecology class at Palm State College, and then I transferred to Broward College, which is where I met 
uh, one, one of, of the other speakers this week, Dr. Dr. Pamela, Pamela Fletcher. And, and she, she was really my guiding light, light and really helped me determine exactly what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. And she really, really made a huge difference in my life. Um, and, and Dr. Fletcher, Fletcher took me down to Nicaragua, where, where I helped her out with some of her conservation work, which she will probably talk about this week. And, and also at Broward College, I was able to take a trip to Africa, to a country, country called Namibia, and, and do some biological field techniques there. So we trapped, trapped some insects, and we actually helped someone track a leopard with a radio collar. So that's what you can see in that photo. We tracked that leopard down and helped some conservationists, and they taught us about the work that they do over there in Africa with big cats. So once, once I was at Broward College, College, I really jumped in and just tried to do as much as I could to get as much hands-on experience as possible. I worked, I worked at a coral nursery down in the Keys. I interned for FDEP for a while, which it was an unpaid internship, so those can be hard too, but made it work. And um, I was able to complete a research project there and do my internship. And, and now here I am working for DEP. After getting all that hands-on experience, I met my manager, Irene, at a volunteer event, and she was looking for someone, and I was looking for a job, and magic just happened. So I definitely recognize how lucky I am and how privileged I've been to have a support system and to have Dr. Fletcher and to have my mom and my family really helping me, number one, decide what I was going to do, and then number two, be able to have the resources to go for it. So that's, so that's my story, story. But, but enough about, about me, that, that was plenty. plenty. We're, we're going to jump into what, what we do with the aquatic preserve. preserve. And, like and like I said, we're just going to run through this a bit, bit quickly, just to give you an overview of some of the stuff, stuff that we do, and uh, then, then I'll, I'll be able to answer any questions, questions that you have. So, so out, out of this whole presentation, I really want you all to remember that at the Indian River Lagoon, we work on a bunch of different projects to protect this estuary that we all depend on. In, in that, that everyone plays, plays an essential role in protecting our planet, planet. And not, not just during Earth Week, all the time. We, we cannot do this without you all. So, our Indian River, River Lagoon Aquatic Reserve has lots of different programs. So, here's the list that we're going to run through. through everything from birds to oysters to people. So, so without further ado, one of the things that we're really busy doing right now is bird monitoring. So, so within, within the Indian River Lagoon, Lagoon, we have those islands that we mentioned called Spoil Islands. islands. We'll, we'll talk about, about those a little bit more later, later but our Spoil Islands are home to many, many different wading bird species that, that use them for nesting. nesting. So, so you can see in this bottom photo, all of those white birds, those are all nesting birds on our um, critical wildlife area, Spoil Island, BC-49. So this is an area that was designated by FWC. To protect, to protect these, these bird species, species because what happens is hundreds of wading birds get together and form a colony, and, and that's where they nest. nest. And they, they like to use the islands because they're safer, they're away from predators, and they, they like to nest over water as well because they're wading birds. They feed on things in the water. So, so during the season, we go out there every month and we count all of the birds and all of the chicks, and it's hundreds and hundreds. And that's what Matthew, a big component of his job is, is going out and doing those monthly surveys. And a lot of the birds that use our islands are threatened federally and, and on a state, state level. So, so these birds need our help. They need us to go out and collect these numbers so that we know what the best way is to protect them and what, what is going on with their population. We do, we do the same thing for birds that nest on the ground. So in the, in the Indian River Lagoon, we have a couple bird species that are ground nesters. So you can see the pictures of their nests on the slide. They just find a spot they like and then plop their egg right on the ground. And they blend in so well. So that's the protection for their eggs is that they blend in so that predators have a hard time finding them. And both of these birds that are pictured are two birds that we do ground nesting monitoring for. And they're both state listed. So that means they're not doing too well in our state. There's not very many left because they used to lay their eggs on the beaches, but now beaches are so busy that they're running out of places to lay their eggs. So that's why it's really important that we protect our spoil islands that have nice, shelly, sandy areas and protect them for these guys so that they can come into town and they can lay their eggs and raise their young in the Indian River Lagoon. So, so to help provide more space for them, we also do bird habitat enhancement. So what we do is we clear areas that we know these birds like to use because they don't want a single bush or tree near where they're nesting. That's their thing. They want to be able to look around and see a 360 and make sure that there's no predators coming for their eggs. So we remove exotic vegetation. And we, we set, set it up perfectly for them. Sometimes we'll even put out fake birds, like you can see in those photos. We'll put out sound systems that make their squawking noises to encourage them to come and nest and give them a safe place to raise their young. 
We, we also, also do diamondback, diamondback terrapin, terrapin research. research. So, so diamondback, diamondback terrapins are a turtle, turtle that not, not many people have heard of. It's, it's our, our only brackish water turtle in North America. America. So, so we, we have sea turtles, turtles and we have freshwater turtles. turtles. And diamondback terrapins are the only ones that live exclusively in the estuary. So they're not sea turtles, they're not freshwater turtles, they're estuary turtles. And we don't really know how many diamondback terrapins we have in Florida. We don't know if they're if we have different subspecies or if they're all the same. So our office has done genetic testing where we trap the turtles and we take some DNA to try to figure out are all of these turtles related? How many do we have left? Are they doing good? Are they not doing so well? So we do research with diamondback terrapins as well. And horseshoe, horseshoe crabs, crabs. We, we also tag to try to figure out what their population is like. And, and we actually use citizen scientists. So if any of you are interested in becoming citizen scientists, we need your help. We're trying, trying to figure out where these animals go. They've, they've been alive since before the time of the dinosaurs, and they look the same as they did those millions of years ago. They've just been crawling around on the ocean floor living their best life, but, but we have no idea how many of them we have. We only see them when they come up to nest on our beaches in the Indian River Lagoon. And then besides that, we have no idea where they go or what they do. So we're using citizen scientists to help us tag these horseshoe crabs. So what we do is we train people and citizens, just like you guys, to go out and tag these horseshoe crabs and to look for tags and to help us figure out do we, do we have, have a really big population of horseshoe crabs? Where, where do, they do they go? We have no idea. So, so we're really trying to use the help of citizens. So if anyone's interested in that, please shoot me an email. We're, we're also doing a horseshoe crab telemetry study. study. So, so it's sort of like the tagging, tagging pictures that you just saw, except for, for this, this specific study, study, we're tagging them with acoustic transmitters. So, so what these do is they send out little pings. We can't hear them, humans can't hear them, and most of the animals in the lagoon can't hear them either. They're at a different frequency. Um, I believe dolphins can hear them, but they're quiet pings, so it doesn't really bother them too much. And what we're trying to figure out with this study is how long horseshoe crabs stay in this cove. This is their favorite cove. Thousands of, of them come to nest. nest. So, so we're, we're trying, trying to figure out, do they hang out in the cove for a long time? Or do, or do they leave the cove? Do they go far away in the lagoon? Or is this really their primary habitat, habitat so, so that we can better protect that habitat? We also, we also do microplastic studies. For these, we, we team up with different universities and research institutions. So the University of Central Florida, Smithsonian Marine Institute, and the Marine Discovery Center. And we team up with them to take water samples and oyster samples to figure out what, what kind of microplastics we have in the lagoon, and our microplastics are those broken down pieces of the plastic that you can only see with a microscope. So we're trying to figure out how much microplastics we have, where they end up, just all sorts of information because this is sort of a new thing. You know, in the past couple of years, we've really realized that plastic doesn't break down and it stays in the lagoon. And are the animals eating the plastic? Is it staying in the water? Answering those types of questions. We also do seagrass monitoring. So, so we go out with, with our water, water management district friends, and, and we look at the seagrass, and we do the same um, transects. We look at the same areas year after year, twice a year, to figure out how the seagrass is doing. Is it doing well? Is it doing worse? Is it coming back? What's the deal with the seagrass? So we actually get in the water for this one, which can sometimes be pretty murky, like you see in that picture, and sometimes it's pretty deep as well. It can be up to 10 feet deep. And we've got to dive all the way to the bottom and hold our breath and count all those blades of grass. So that's, so that's a really fun, fun day, day in the field where I get to get in the water in. The other day when we were doing it, I had a manatee bump into me, so that scared me a lot. But it was it's a fun time, and we get lots of useful information from those seagrass surveys. We also do work with oyster habitat, so we monitor natural oyster reefs. We help create oyster reef habitat and try to bring back some of our reefs that aren't doing so well. And we also do consultation to make sure that people's oyster reef projects are actually successful and then that they're monitoring them to make sure that if they're not successful, we pull them out. On the bottom picture, that's an unsuccessful oyster reef restoration. So we work with people to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if it does, we pull it out and try something new. Sort of like, like the oyster reef, reef stuff, stuff, we do permitting and consultation. And consultation. So, so lots of people live along the Indian River Lagoon, and there are lots of homes all along the water. So what we do is we sort of look at permits. When, when people are applying for new docks and construction in the lagoon, we look at all of those and make sure that they're still keeping the animals safe. We also help with living shorelines, so encouraging people not just to have a seawall that's made out of concrete and metal, but to have plants and maybe some oyster reef in 
encourage the mangrove growth in. So we try to protect our shorelines and work with the people who live along the lagoon to protect our shorelines and work with our FDEP permitting partners to keep everything in the lagoon safe while allowing people to enjoy the lagoon and live on it as well. We also, we also do that spoil island management. management. So we, we talked about, about these islands before. before. They're, They're the islands that when the intercoastal waterway, which is like I-95 for boats, throughout the lagoon, there's a big channel, which is called the intercoastal waterway, that allows big boats to go from Florida all the way up to Maine. And that ICW, that intercoastal waterway, goes through the entire lagoon. So when they dredge that up to make it deeper for those big boats, Back, Back in the day, day, in the 40s and 50s, they, they just piled that sand in mounds and they, they turned into islands. So now, now we manage those islands for different, different things. We manage them for conservation and we manage them for recreation. So our conservation islands, we protect for animals to use. And then the recreation islands, we encourage people to use for camping. You can kayak and boat out to the islands and camp on them. And we, we just want to make sure that those islands stay nice and clean. So that's where our Leave No Trace program comes from. from. We, we are, are a Leave No Trace hotspot. So the Leave, Leave No Trace is a separate entity. They work all over the country and they, they came to us to help us do education and outreach for people who are using our islands to keep their, to pack their trash out with them and to bring, bring their human waste out with them as well because there's no bathrooms on our islands. So I encourage you to check out Leave No Trace. They have tips for how to outdoors anywhere, anywhere you go, go whether, whether it's out west or in Florida, Florida they have tons, tons of tips to help you enjoy the outdoors while also keeping it clean and nice for all the people who come after you and we, and we also have the bark ranger program as part of the leave no trace so that's, so that's encouraging people to follow, follow rules about their dogs because dogs can be really scary for some of our different birds and animals in our aquatic preserve so we want people to be aware of that and pay attention to where dogs are allowed and aren't allowed this is one of my projects our community garden project so, so we, we have, have this one up in Titusville, and, and we made a community garden for people to come and learn about lagoon-friendly landscaping. So, so there's certain things that everyone as a citizen around the lagoon can do to their yard to help keep our lagoon healthier. So that, that was the idea behind this project. And then a lot of what we do in my job is talking to other people. So talking to you guys today, talking to other scientists, talking to other research groups, other government agencies. Um, working, working with, with we, we do, do everything from schools, Girl Scouts, Scouts and Boy Scouts, local clubs, just talking, talking to everybody to really do our best for the lagoon. lagoon. So, so like, like I said, we work on a diverse projects, projects keeping our estuary, estuary healthy, and that, that everyone, everyone plays a role in helping to keep our estuary, estuary healthy. So, so these, these are some of the things that you all can do to help keep the estuary healthy. Um, so some of it's really basic. basic. If, if you, you guys, guys are going to the grocery store, store with your parents, parents bring along reusable bags. bags. Everyone should have one of these reusable water bottles if you can get one because not only are they super cool and you can cover them in stickers, stickers but they save you so much money that that on plastic and then you don't have to try to do any more research on microplastics in the lagoon. <laughs> so we want to limit our use of plastics. And another cool thing you can do is take shorter showers or shut the water off when you brush your teeth. Save energy. Just, Just those simple things that you hear about helping the environment, a lot of those will directly help the lagoon as well. And here are some advice from the team, so you can go ahead and read over that quickly. And we, and we can, can always, always go back, back to, to that, that slide, slide as well. And that's, that's it for me. Awesome, uh, awesome. Thank you so much. Round of applause for Emily. Everyone, please join me. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry to have to kind of speed up the process. We have a hard stop at 11. So right now, um, before we show, um, we, before we start the Q and A session, if you want to learn more about how you all can be involved in Florida Department of Environmental Protection events, please visit this website at www.fosifl.org, and we'll be sending over the information as well. So now, for my favorite session, is the Q and A session. Are you guys ready? All right. So again, we only have a couple questions that we can ask due to time. So any questions you have, please feel free to put it into the chat. I already see some questions coming in. So one question that we'll start with is, um, what career mistake has given you the biggest lesson? So again, the question is, 
what career mistake has given you the biggest lesson? That's, That's a, a great, great question, question because, because in my career, career I've made plenty, plenty of mistakes, mistakes. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm willing, willing to admit, admit those completely because, because I have learned from all of them. them. So probably, probably the biggest one would be my senior research project in college, which is supposed to be a pretty big deal. It's your first research project. I totally messed mine up, <laughs> and then I actually... Uh, I was, I was working with two species of oysters, and I misidentified one. So I thought that this type of oyster was actually a different type of oyster. And wrote my whole project up and finished it and didn't even realize until I was done that I had the name of the oyster incorrect for the entire project. So what I learned from that is to ask questions. If you're not sure, make sure. And don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, there's never a dumb question. It's okay to ask. Um, and, that's and that's really what I learned from that, that is if you're not sure, sure just ask it, you know, it's, it's not, not a big deal. deal. People, People are happy to answer your questions. questions so make sure, sure you ask. And that was what I learned from that. Awesome. We'll make sure to ask questions. Actually, one <laughs> more question uh, just to conclude everything. Um, so how has the field changed in the fa uh, past five years or from the time that you started working at FDEP? That's, that's a, a great, great question, question, especially for us with working, working in the government. government. So, so really... What, what we do in our work depends on you all as the citizens. So that's, that's how things change in my field is it depends on what citizens are pushing for, which is really important to know because as you guys get older, you have a voice now and your parents have a voice and you all have a voice. If you use them to really make sure that your government and your government agencies hear you, and know that the environment is really important to you, that will send us what we're going to be able to do. You know, it sends us more money. It helps, um, you know, who my overheads know that the citizens are really, really pushing for a healthier lagoon. And then that helps us be able to do more work. So really the drivers of change for my job are all of you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. So now we're going to be concluding everything. But before we go, I want to invite you all to make an impact. Even this Sunday, we have a cleanup that's taking place at Coral, uh, at Coral Cove Beach. And we hope you can join us. If you want to sign up, please visit us at www.weloveyousa.org. And feel free to sign up through our landing page. One more thing before we go. Team, are you guys ready? So we want to say very quick. One, two, three. We love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you all so much. And we'll see you tomorrow for our next session. I hope you all have an amazing day. Thank you.